This pub's called the King James because it was a location of one of the defining events in the history of Scotland and the life of James I. My name's Bruce Fumi and I'm from Perth. But whilst Perth's the most important city in my life, at one point it was also the most important city in the life of Scotland. Until events in this pub on the 21st of February 1437. Now, in those days it was a monastery, but I reckon that the monks liked a bit of tipple. But before I tell you about the events of that night, let me tell you what led up to it as I show you around Perth. Come on. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then hit the subscribe button at the bottom right and ring the notification bell to find out when I publish new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. King James I of Scotland was an accomplished musician, played several instruments, was a published poet, an athletic sportsman, cultured, sophisticated and intelligent. You know that guy at school who could do everything? Then he went round to his house for tea and it turns out his dad was the king! For the loch so the day are the jewels and the crown of a schoon coronation And the streams o' oh, the shire coast of county I dare stay me The thing is, that his dad wasn't that impressive. Robert III, they called him, yeah, at least to his face. Apparently, he was kicked by a horse and he was never quite the same again. The thing is, that nobody really respected him. Here in Perth, we call this parkland the North Inch. It was open parkland back at the turn of the 15th century too. Now, one time, because Robert III was too ineffectual to impose his will and to keep order in the Highland clans, the only way to decide a dispute between two of them was for them each to choose 30 of their best warriors and to fight to the death here in this park. It was a huge affair. They built a stand over there for King Robert to watch. It was like Perth's version of Gladiator. Let's take a walk along the river. I want to show you something. Incidentally, the guy at our school who was a musical, sporty, brainy, bound to be head boy guy was also called James. Jim Malcolm. It's his music that's playing in the background just now and I'll leave a link to his YouTube channel in a white tab above and in the description below. If you like Scottish folk music, he's your man. Now, the river runs along the edge of the North Inch and through the town. And on the other side, upstream, is Schoon. Now you might just be able to see Schoon Palace in the trees behind me. Across there at Schoon's, where Scottish kings had been inaugurated for centuries. They held parliaments there too. But because Robert III wasn't up to running the country, his brother tended to do that for him. He was called Robert, Duke of Albany, and he was a bit dodgy. Now, if you're worried that King Robert III has a brother who's also called Robert, then I should probably say that Robert, Duke of Albany, abducted his brother, Robert III's son, and the heir to the throne, imprisoned him in his castle at Falkland, 15 miles that way, locked him up and starved him to death. And that's maybe a wee bit more important detail for you to focus on at this point. In fact, it's that detail that caused Robert III to send his second son, James, your brainy schoolmate, to France for safety. Long story short, he was captured by English pirates and spent 18 years as a hostage in England. Now, because the shock of his capture killed Daddy Robert III, all the time James was hostage in England, he was the new King of Scots. His elder brother having been murdered by his uncle Robert, Duke of Albany, which is what caused James to flee in the first place. Now, if you're not Scottish, you might want to switch on the subtitles and rewind to play that a second time. Now, during the time James I was being held by the English, Scotland had to save France from the English 
because of an alliance that we had with the French. That has got to be awkward. Now this is a hugely important part of Scottish history and I've got videos that will give you more background. They're really popular and you should watch them. I'll leave a link at the end. Now, not only was Scotland making war with England at the very time that their king was a hostage, but James's uncle, Robert, Duke of Albany, the guy that had run the country in place of James's father and murdered his brother, you know that one? Well, he didn't seem too keen to pay the ransom for James's release. Funny that, eh? Eventually, James got back to Scotland with no help from the Albany side of the Stuart family, incidentally. Oh, apart from his uncle Walter. He helped a bit, but we'll come back to him later. The Scotland that James came back to had been run by his uncle Robert and then his cousin all during his dad's reign and then for the 18 years of his own stay in England. The Albany Stuarts had held the power, the patronage and the authority. Now the Douglases in the south, they were also pretty powerful and the Lord of the Isles was the dominant force in the north. James had to negotiate these groups. His position was weak, the royal coffers were bare and he had a huge ransom to pay. Lucky White Heather. James arrived back in Scotland in April 1424. But before he'd even held his first parliament at Schoon in May, he'd imprisoned one of his Albany nephews. At that first parliament up the river, he cut off the jobs and patronage that his Albany cousin had used to secure favours. Then, he started to review lands and titles and reorganise estates, depriving some nobles of revenue and acquiring it for himself. But he couldn't go too far. The Albany Stuarts and the Douglases, remember. Then in August, James had a stroke of luck. Remember, the Scots had an army in France saving the French from the English. Well, they suffered a terrible defeat. How's that lucky for the king? James had had to tread carefully because this army of Scots abroad were led by the Earl of Buchan, an Albany Stuart, and Archibald Earl of Douglas, a black Douglas members of the two most powerful rival families, and now both were dead. Now, James didn't have to worry about leaders of the two most powerful rival families coming back with an army from France. He could go banana, and he did. By March the 20th, 1425, less than a year after he'd arrived back in Scotland, he'd imprisoned the Albany Stuarts. Apart from his uncle Walter that helped him gain release. He'd reduced the power of the Douglases and he'd diverted lands and revenues to himself. Check, mate. By the 20th of May, a year almost to the day since that first parliament, he'd figuratively and literally decapitated the Albany Stuarts. Now he could relax. For the locks of the tay are the jewels in the crown of a schoon coronation. The river Tay here is like a bridge between highlands and lowlands, and Perth here is the brow of it at the main crossing point. With his work done in the lowlands, James turned to the highlands. He summoned John Lord of the Isles and Northern Clan chiefs to a meeting of a parliament in Inverness. When they got there, he imprisoned them. Now some were later released, some were taken to imprisonment in the lowlands, and some were hung. This is St John's Kirk. The original building would have been here in the 11th century. It's what gave Perth its old name as St Johnston. Macbeth probably worshipped the original one. They started rebuilding it around the middle of the 15th century, just after James. But James had his own plans for the Scottish church. He created new laws about what churchmen could and couldn't do. And to stamp his authority, he ordered a Carthusian monastery to be built here in Perth, which would be a model for the rest of the country. It was the only Carthusian monastery in Scotland. They say that it was the most magnificent building built just outside the city walls. Sadly, 
when John Knox kicked off the Scottish Reformation in this church in 1559, the Carthusian monastery was destroyed by the mob. Anyway, with a tight grip at home on church, nobility and personal income, James now needed to deal with foreign affairs. And in 1428, he renewed the alliance with France with a treaty signed, of course, here in Perth. His daughter would marry the King of France and the mutual defence pact would continue. Now, it took seven years and a convenient realignment of forces in the continent before James acted on that mutual defence treaty and besieged Roxburgh Castle. It all ended in a humiliating retreat as English forces approached. He also, though, had humiliating military setbacks with the Lord of the Isles, remember who he'd brutalised earlier. Now, a bit like his descendant Charles I 200 years later, in October 1436, James wanted Parliament to give him more money for military spending, but the Parliament said no. And one guy, Sir Robert Graham, even tried to arrest the King. Oh, he's got a hard neck. I wonder if that's where that phrase came from. Anyway, Graham got away with just jail and then exile. The thing is that Sir Robert Graham had several gripes with King James to do with disinheritance and landed gentry type stuff. Worse still, so did Walter Stewart, Earl of Athol. Remember Uncle Walter? The one member of the Albany Stuarts that James hadn't hacked off. Well, now he had. James had been up to his old tricks again, controlling estates and grasping revenue. Four months after the aborted arrest fiasco, there was a general council meeting on the 4th of February here in Perth, after which James decided to take a well-earned rest back at the pub where we started, the Blackfriars Monastery. Now during his relaxation, he'd been playing tennis. Not Andy Murray tennis, old style three musketeers tennis. The point is, he kept losing his balls. Don't even think about it. He'd had the gratings blocked across the sewers to make sure that they couldn't drop down and he wouldn't lose his balls in the toilet. Stop it. What he didn't realise was what was going on in the background. A scheme had been hatched by Uncle Walter, Sir Robert Graham and all the other nobles, retainers and loyalists to the Albany Stuarts who felt cheated by the last 13 years of James's personal rule. The plan would be affected by Walter's son, James's nephew, who was the King's Chamberlain and so had access to James's chambers. He would let in a gang of up to 30 disaffected Albany adherents who saw James's heavy-handed approach as a threat, but his retreat in the face of Highlanders and English as a weakness. A combination that meant his death would be little mourned. So they'd murder him. Now the story goes that his nephew, the Chamberlain, let the band of murderers in. James sees the danger. He tells one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, Catherine Douglas, to bar the door as he jumps down the latrine pit to escape through the sewers. But Catherine Douglas realises she can't bolt the door to the assailants because the sneaky nephew Chamberlain's thought of that and he's removed the door's crossbar. Catherine puts her own arm through the brackets in place of the wooden bar. Now, needless to say, that's not enough, and the assailants crash through the door, splintering her arm in the process. Seeing the empty room and the open latrine pit, they jump down to chase James through the sewer. But James, who was ahead of them, had a problem. He'd ordered the sewers to be blocked up, remember, so that he wouldn't lose his tennis balls. Now he was trapped with no way out. He turns to face his assailants. He stoutly defends himself, but he's hugely outnumbered. He's stabbed again and again and again. And James I, musician, poet, sportsman, intellectual, European rebirth sophisticating king, died on the 21st of February, 1437, in a sewer in Perth. What a shitty way to go. Now, we're not quite finished, this behind me was the site of James's magnificent Carthusian monastery where he was buried. But with these events, the importance of Perth as a centre of royal power and influence declined, and we've now lost all trace of James or his magnificent monastery that stood here. 
Now, remember, if you want to understand why Scottish armies were in France and how it relates to the story, then there's a link coming up on the screen in a video here. In the meantime, I mean, Doc is going to be la my life. Cheers, guys. You'll spend your life fearing the death, but you'll never die.